So what are the major risk factors? So promiscuous uh, behavior, many, many sexual partners. Uh, so there's no, there's no real cutoff and all, but it's the, the, the more the number of partners, the higher the chance of acquiring uh, HPV infection, right? Also the age at which they become sexually active, that is also is, uh, one of the predicting uh, factors. Uh, and also, uh, usually HPV doesn't come alone, it comes along with other sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, most common is HIV. And now HIV, even after so many years, we still don't have a vaccine for HIV, right? Uh, but we have very good treatment for HIV. So people who, who take this antiretroviral medicines, HIV is under control, but the HPV is not under control. So they will have a false sense of protection that I'm taking antivirals, uh, that should take care of all infections. It doesn't, but only works for HIV because HPV is a totally different. It's it's not a RNA virus. It's a different virus. So HIV medicine is not going to kill your HPV. HPV has to be de dealt with separately. Uh, there's no good antiviral treatments for HPV. The, the only effective way is the vaccines. Also, those people who are having, due to other comorbidities, they have a weakened immune system. So at the end of the day, it's a host versus microbiome, right? So it's the immune system that comes into the play and also environmental factors like smoking. So smoking has a strong association, statistical association with squamosal cervical cancer. And there are some drug induced, some, uh, some drugs that have been widely used. Uh, for example, this is in the early 1950s and all, it's, it's not there today. Uh, the dietyl silvestrol and some other drugs are also uh, which have been prescribed during pregnancy or those kind of things but it's it's not a big deal now this is like hist historical out of historical context you can go and read about that uh, it's not a but there is some some link with oral contraceptives uh, but it's not a direct link just some statistical association with oral contraceptive pills maybe because People who are on oral contraceptive pills, they don't practice safe sex. At the end of the day, it's all about safe sex. Uh, as long as there's no bodily fluid exchange, then you minimize the chances of sexually transmitted diseases. So when you are on oral contraceptive pills, they don't, they don't do the protective measures like condoms. Uh, wearing the males will not wear the condoms. So then there's a chance of uh, HPV infection, very high infection because it's, they're not protected. <clears throat> So again, the, uh, not only the virus, there are other environmental factors which we discussed earlier because a uh, lot of people living with HPV infection, but th this could be like a non-pathogenic common soul. This could be coming and going, right? It's not like, it's not like they have the infection constantly. It's coming and going uh, and it's not a permanent problem, but this, these women will never develop cancer. So only a minority of this women uh, who are developing cancer. So, so not all HPV infection causes cancer. So that's something that to know. So although there's a strong association, it's not the only factor. It's, it's a cancer is always driven by genetics and mutations and the loss of uh, DNA repair machinery, like we discussed last time. And also uh, the lack of the immune system. Uh, normally small things, the immune system can take care. But in many scenarios, the immune system cannot deal with uh, uh, this kind of uh, you know, epithelial cells. Uh, especially melanoma, for example, uh, skin cancers, anything on the epithelium, the immune system does not have access to that. There's no good blood vessels. They don't have access to that. Uh, so there are certain parts of the body where the immune system cannot penetrate very well, right? So these are, this is the typical of epithelial cell cancers. So the stages, the actual, there are four stages. So stage one, cervical cancer mainly found on the cervix. Uh, so it's very easy to detect. Uh, it's very small and at this stage, uh, surgery is basically curative and stage two, uh, it is spreading beyond the cervix and the uterus, but it has not entered the other parts of the pelvis. And stage three, you have uh, other parts of the pelvis are now involved and also it can go to nearby lymph nodes. It's a lymph node uh, invasive. Then at stage three, it's already invasive. There's a lymph node metastasis. And stage four, it can spread into nearby organs, like the most common is the, is the bladder and the, and the GI tract, right? And it can also go to distant organs, uh, like bone metastasis or lung metastasis, that's a stage four. Typically, we see patients from what I gather from, we have done some small projects uh, for cervical cancer, from more from a pathology, digital pathology perspective. So from whatever clinical data we have gathered, uh, typically, the women who present are at stage three and above. So it's very rare to see a stage one or a stage two cervical cancer, especially in, in South India. 
uh, because that's the that's our sample size from whatever experience we have. Uh, so if we can find it at stage one or stage two, uh, then we can uh, then the then the treatment is better. We have a better treatment option: surgery and chemotherapy and radiation therapy. It's manageable better. The clinical outcomes are better if you diagnose it at early stage. So that's where the early diagnosis is coming up in a in a very big way. Breast cancer and cervical cancer are the most easiest. You do a mammogram, you do a pap test, very easy. In pap test, you have multiple types. You have the smear, pap smear, then you have the liquid cytology. Uh, so routinely done by several labs in, in India, like uh, Lucy Diagnostics, uh, Vijay Diagnostics, everybody is doing this. Uh, it's part of the corporate wellness program. Uh, so it's very easy to detect uh, uh, HPV infection, abnormal cells in the pap smear very easily. Then they can go for follow-ups. Also, there's a separate uh, kits for HPV. What type of HPV is it pathogenic or non-pathogenic? Now, there is there a point of care test, which is coming up for HPV. That's also coming up. After the COVID thing, now people like this pregnancy strip kind of test. Just put a few drops of urine and you see whether it's a positive or negative, right? So that is something people are interested in uh, doing this kind of point of care test. A lot of people are working on it. So today, it's a RT-PCR based test. You have to send the sample to a lab and they do it and they send the reports back. So what are the early signs and symptoms of uh, you know, early stage cervical cancer? Usually it's a, a watery or a bloody vaginal discharge. So any, any kind of discharge, something that's abnormal, right? And then sometimes it it's, uh, it's, uh, has secondary bacterial infections or fungal infections. So then you have the foul order or uh, vaginal bleeding. So during intercourse, which is not normal, you know, and uh, also abnormal menstrual period. Sometimes the menstrual period may be heavier or the duration may last longer. So all kinds of menstrual abnormalities, then it's better to go and get checked up. So, it, so we usually suspect uh, sexually transmitted diseases if there's no other explanation, right? So you have to go and get checked up. That's, so, yes, so STDs are the easiest to diagnose. There are plenty of kids, test kits in the market. They can easily diagnose it at an early stage. And if the cancer has spread to the nearby tissues or organs, uh, like the urinary bladder or the rectum or other parts of the pelvis, uh, so then you may, the symptoms may not be vaginal. It could be presenting like a urinary tract infection, like a UTI, a difficult or painful urination, sometimes uh, blood and urine, right? So hematuria. Uh, also, if it enters the rectum, there are situations uh, where the, it's not it's not even a vaginal or, or a urethra. It is completely a GA. It looks, it presents like a GA problem, but actually it's a cervical cancer, right? So there is diarrhea, pain, and blood in the stool. Also, uh, bleeding, uh, actual fresh, fresh bleeding. You know, it's not just the uh, discolored uh, stool, but it's actually fresh bleeding. So when there's blood in the stool, we al always suspect it could be a, uh, the, it could be the the, the piles problem, the hemorrhoids. Uh, so if it, in case of women, uh, they have to go and get better checked at the OBG. The gynecologist also should take a look at it. Uh, so so gastroenterologist should work one on one with gynecologists. So this is the this is what is missing right now. The specialized once you go more specialized, you only focus on that one organ. You forget this is not an organ. This is a human being, <laughs> right? So as and when required, you always get a consult, uh, especially for women. Always get an OBG consult if you are a gastroenterologist. And we suspect, could this be cervical cancer? So send, send them to the colleague to get a checked up. It's very easy, just kind of do a colposcopy and they can do some pap smear and they can confirm it immediately. So this is a very easiest uh, thing that you can easily diagnose, right? Uh, but still it's missed, so such an easy thing. It's still missed. So many women don't get diagnosed at an early stage. Uh, by the time they come, it's already in advanced stage. Of course, all the other symptoms are like any cancers, you have fatigue, loss of appetite, and uh, unexplained weight loss, uh, general malice, and uh, all, the entire body is like aching, you know, uh, sometimes pedal edema. Uh, but the most classic symptom is the, the pelvic pain, the unexplained pain, no matter what you do, the pain doesn't go away, right? So that's, uh, that's definitely, they need to go and get checked up, unexplained pain. So the, the most common uh, treatment is surgery followed by chemotherapy or radiation. Uh, depends on uh, di the different uh, uh, flow charts, depending on the, the presentation, depending on uh, what stage of the disease. Uh, so typically, if the if the lady already had children, then they go for a total hysterectomy. So there are different versions of that. Uh, there's a radical and a modified radical. And then there's a, only a cervix alone. It's not taking the uterus, only the cervix alone. 
or a total pelvic excentration if it's a very advanced disease. And radiation is the most effective in cervical cancer. And radiation, again, there are two types. Either you go with, uh, with external radiation uh, targeted focus with that uh, newer the Tesla machines or an internal radiation with, uh, with a device, uh, a radioactive device that goes inside the, inside the pelvis, inside the vaginal, and it's, uh, that device will emit radiation from the inside. So internal radiation will have less effect on, on the bones uh, because external radiation, you're basically radiating the entire pelvis, uh, including the bone marrow, right? We don't want to do that. So internal radiation, and then there's a brachy therapy, and a lot of new therapies have come. A lot of new developments are happening in the radiation side. So cervical cancer, by default, you'll find all the cervical cancer patients in the radiation oncology department. That's where you'll find them, uh, because that's the most popular, most common, uh, this one. Also chemotherapy, typically a platinum-based regimen for the chemotherapy. Also, irinotecan and topotecan, all these uh, uh, drugs are also uh, recently been tried with very good success rates. Uh, now there are a lot of combination therapies. And now people are talking about this uh, latest, one of the biggest breakthroughs uh, in cervical cancer in recent years is this new concept called uh, antibody drug conjugates, ADC, uh, tisotumab vedotin. So vedotin is a, is a chemotherapy drug and tisotumab is a tissue factor targeted antibody. So you combine the monoclonal antibodies with a drug, this antibody only goes to the, uh, the cervical cancer, wherever the cancer is, it goes there and the drug will only act there. The drug is not released anywhere else. There's enzymatic cleavage, which makes the drug active. So in the rest of the body, the drug will stay in an inactive form. It will eventually get excreted by the kidneys and other uh, liver conjugation and other things. So this is like a, using a monoclonal antibody, targeting the cancer and delivering the drug conjugate at that point of the cancer, right? So this is a very, very targeted approach. So this is, this uh, recent clinical trials have shown phenomenal success compared to the previous uh, therapies. Uh, even it's uh, compared to standard of care, like a cisplatin uh, based uh, regimens. So tisotumab is coming up in a big way. And also there have been some studies on, uh, we discussed about immunotherapy, spendrolizumab, uh, PD-1, PDL one positive patients. And there are also newer therapies coming up in the, in the clinical trials, newer versions of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, but uh, as of today, uh, ADCs, antibody drug conjugates, seem to be the, the best way to go. Also, the antibody drug conjugate, the vedotin can be replaced uh, with, a, with a radioactive drug, right? Instead of just giving a chemical drug, you can actually conjugate a radio ligand with a MAP. Uh, that's a study going on in some clinical trials. That's very promising because now you don't have to go for a separate radiation treatment. The antibody will deliver the radiation directly at the, at the site of cancer. So that is very promising, actually. So radio ADCs and ADC with radio like us. This is a this is a trend where we are going. So eventually, I think uh, targeted therapies are going to be the main mainstay uh, for cervical cancer treatment.